All right, welcome to the Monochrome Podcast. This is a feel-good, lighthearted podcast from the SALT community, brought to you and hosted by the SALT team. We're so excited that you guys are joining us specifically for episode one. You're going to get a great preview of what you're in for. Not only a preview, we're doing a whole episode, let's just be clear. But this episode specifically has the entire SALT team on here. It will not get too chaotic, we promise, but we all have such valuable little tidbits we want to share. And so we're so glad you're joining us for this first episode. I want to start by doing little intros for each of us uh, as our voices are new to you guys in the community. All of you who are maybe joining the SALT community for the first time, you might not know who we are. So let me kick things off. I am Caitlin Johnson. I am the SALT director uh, for the conference, for the SALT community and the different initiatives that we have throughout the year. Very happy to be joining you and hosting for today's podcast episode. Uh, a little unique fun thing about me, I am an author. I've written about four different novels with three more to be published this year. Super excited about that. And I am just glad to be doing this podcast with you guys. I think we have such fun and creative things to share, such unique perspectives, which just give me a little tickle, happy gigglies to think about all the different perspectives we're going to bring to the table for the whole community to listen to. Um, but joining me is also Kaylee Lindsay. Kaylee, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'd love to. Hello, I am Kaylee. I'm the partner relations lead here at SALT, which basically means I'm the personality hire. I am the one getting coffee virtually with everyone on Zoom from Spark, oh my gosh, sponsors to churches to our community. And when I'm not thought, I am writing a children's book and I am working on my first EP and helping my husband build his coffee business. Mm, coffee, hmm? I think mm -hmm. we have a lot of coffee snobs in our salt community, so they'll be happy to hear that you are a coffee mm -hmm. aficionado not only because you're a big coffee drinker, but you're doing a coffee business with your husband. That's huge. I think a future yeah. episode may need to have a segment of how to make the perfect pour over. Can I just add that? Ooh, yes. 100%. We can have Matt on the podcast. He's like a salt mascot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to be honest. Coffee fuels many people in our community, many people listening to this podcast. So a coffee focused episode might not be a bad idea. Uh, and that voice you just heard was Luke McRoy, Salt's founder and visionary. And I hope I didn't just steal your thunder, but Luke, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself for those listening. Yeah, I'll actually clarify. I'm actually one of the co-founders, uh, often a misnomer that I am the <clears throat> sole founder. But um, yeah, I'm also an author and had lots of things to share about that. But I feel like the more fun fact is uh, every single night I get to put my girls down. We have a dance party and it's all out. And many members of the team have experienced that over the years, but we have a lot of fun. So, so excited to be here, guys. That's awesome. Uh, there's your creative challenge for the day. Have a dance party with your kids before bedtime. Yeah, our song of choice. Just, not only. Song of choice, Run by One Republic. And so my daughter will just go, run, run, run. <laughs> every, every night? Every night the every same night. song? Yep, it was my Spotify top song <laughs> last year and my wife's. And no getting around that. So. Awesome. Um, speaking of running, we have a team member on the episode today who often takes his lunch breaks by going for runs. Keith Beck, everybody. Hello, my name is Keith Beck. I'm the manager of content and learning at Salt Community, and I oversee the content that you may have seen on our site, saltuniversity.com. If you're not a member, we would love for you to join and uh, join the community. I spent over 15 years in student ministry uh, before coming to Salt, so I have a perspective of what it's like the day in, day out of, of ministry, especially when you might be the only one doing quite a bit of things. Um, a fun fact about me, I am a huge movie buff. I will talk your head off about my favorite movies and opinions and whatnot. Due to possibly a personality quirk, I keep a running list of every single movie I see, and I have a personal rating for them. So yes, I have a lot of opinions. All right, I want to make one piece of commentary on that because he said he has 15 years of ministry experience knowing the days in and day out. I would actually say he has 15 years of knowing what middle school boys smell like after a hard workout <laughs> or something because well, that's my picture of, of youth ministry. Is that fair, Keith? Yes, plus the two years that I actually was a middle school boy, so you can tack two more years on that number. <laughs> 
You can't discredit that experience right no, there. No, you never forget the smell. <laughs> I was about to say, well, I can last... smell the axe from here. <laughs> from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> All the way from Texas. <laughs> Well, last but not least, we've got JT Bowling, who is our uh, other team member who is helping to host and be on these podcast episodes with us. What's up, Salt community? I am the marketing manager at Salt. I get the joy of creating posts and sharing the incredible stories that come out of Salt. Uh, I also have the pleasure of working with all of these wonderful people. Uh, And something we're not really talking about, we're all over the country right now. Some of us are in Tennessee, some of us are in Texas, uh, and you might have heard a little bit from our little intros and recaps there. Some of us have worked at churches and in ministry for many years, some for a few years, so we are bringing that experience to the table, but mostly we're coming, I think, as the SALT team, knowing what our SALT community needs as creative and technical people in the local church, we're coming to you with a few different, what I would say are segments with each episode. Uh, We're going to talk about kind of what's in the news that applies to you, your team in the church, like what's in your cart, what are you listening to, what are you watching, where we talk about what, again, things that we think we're seeing as a team that might apply to you and your team or you and what you do. And then with each episode, we're also going to have a good creative challenge. Now, I know some of you are maybe more of those technical nerd types where you're like, oh, I'm just not creative. I would argue everybody is creative in just a different way. Even if you don't think you're very creative, you still got a little bit of a creative bone. Everyone's got a bone, whether it's teeny tiny or really big creative side of them. Uh, You can flex and work that creativity. And so we have a creative challenge we're gonna end every episode with to help challenge that and help you grow in that. Uh, But first, for today's episode, we are gonna kick things off with some salt news brought to you by Keith. All right. I have been looking forward to this segment. Uh, I got to be honest, ever since I saw the video late last fall, so it's not necessarily the newest of news, but I have talked to many people that are not aware that this is a thing that's out there that's on the market and is being built. So what it is, is it's called the AI pen by a company named Humane. Humane is led by two former company or former employees, engineers of Apple who left the company because they wanted to create something that was the next wave of technology. And so they came up with this idea of a pen that is probably about the size of like a Tic Tac case. And it goes on your clothing, whether you have a jacket or shirt or whatever, the battery acts is is actually a magnet that you put on the inside of your clothing to attach it to. Um, This thing can be, used uh it, it it the interaction points of this thing are things like voice commands touch commands on the pad um hand gestures uh it also has visual recognition of what it's seeing um the hand gesture thing is really cool apparently you can stick out your your palm and it will project a screen on that hand and depending on how you move your hand, be it backwards, forwards, side to side, you can navigate a menu. Anytime you want to go deeper into that menu or select something, maybe you want to listen to some music and you're kind of scrolling through a playlist and you decide, yes, I want to listen to that uh, Usher song because of the Super Bowl halftime show and I forgot about that song and I love it. You will connect your pointer finger to your thumb and that is a signal to the AI pen that you are selecting that thing that it's projecting on your hand. So very kind of a a neat kind of design there. Um, There is one really cool aspect of this thing that I think uh, could really be used if you're like a backpacker. When you are interacting with someone who is not speaking your, your native tongue, be it English or Spanish or whatever it is, this person, the the pen recognizes this person's tongue, translates it, and then speaks it to you so that you can hear what they're actually trying to communicate with you. And then when you respond to them, it will respond to them with your cadence and with your register. So it will sound similar to your voice, but in another language. So it's kind of in a way like the the reverse Tower of Babel in a way uh, that if everybody had one of these, there would literally be no need to like worry about learning a new language because AI's got you, right? 
Uh, I feel maybe, like you just AI gotta, Jesus juked us, by the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm I'm not saying that, that that it's playing God here, but it's it, it does kind of bridge that gap that has been created in 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 this world of like being divided based on on how you speak, what you say. Uh, one of the other things that's uh, crazy about this thing is that it can actually video your day. Okay, this brings up some privacy concerns, I'm sure, but. At the end of your day, you can actually tell your AI pen, will you replay notable moments of my day? Or will you replay that meeting I had with Luke? And it will literally go back and replay it for you. Okay, so definitely seems like there probably is going to be the issue of like asking people whether or not you can wear your AI pen in the room. <laughs> because do you want whatever's going to be said or done uh, replayed later? So let's get into kind of the cost of this thing, okay? So it's they're asking for $699 to buy the pen, but then on top of it, there's a subscription fee of $24 a month for a dedicated cell line and full access to their cloud storage, as well as Humane's suite of AI-powered services. So there's different um, software companies that have created... Uh, software specifically for this pen and you can utilize those things to get the most out of your AI by paying the subscription fee so I guess that kind of opens things up for discussion a little bit like what maybe is your privacy concerns do you see it as practical is this the future would you even buy one what do you guys think I it's funny so Luke just shared the this new updated article about this pen that they're already laying off. How many people was it, Luke? Like four uh, percent. <laughs> while you were speaking, I was like, "Oh, this is a great start already." They haven't even launched. <laughs> they haven't even launched. They're supposed to launch in March, and so and they've already laid off four percent. And I was thinking about this last night when I was reading through Keith's segment here, um, and I because Google Glass is just or not Google Glass, Apple VR Vision, whatever it is, has just come out. Um, and I was thinking through like, okay, if I am going to wear this pin, would I want that over like the glasses or some other device that is already way more advanced than this probably is as cool as it is. So I don't know. I'm thinking it's cool, but they're not going to outdo Apple. They're not going to outdo like Elon's brain chip or any of that stuff. Man, I want to take us back to like when the day the iPhone was released. I remember it so well. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this device is going to change the way we interact. I feel like they're attempting to create a pin that kind of somewhat replaces your iPhone. Like, I, as I've looked into this, I remember watching the very first video and thinking, this is like Minority Report meets Siri or Alexa. And my thought is, I just hope they're better than Siri and Alexa because both of those had a lot of promise and very little <laughs> follow through. I feel like nine times out of 10, I tell Alexa, hey, do this. And she's like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so useless to me. <laughs> so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this like plays out, but I don't feel that excitement. I mean, I kind of feel the same thing about Vision Pro right now. I think it's almost so early. I, I actually relate Vision Pro, what Apple's releasing, to like the Apple Newton, which was like, what, five, 10 years prior to the Apple iPhone that ended up actually taking, you know, sort of culture by storm. So yeah, this is gonna be interesting. This is fascinating. Yeah, I think the for people that may be concerned about the privacy, they claim that this thing is not recording unless told to, and that it can protect, uh, if it's ever tampered with, it literally will shut down, and it the only way to reactivate it is to send it into Humane and have them reactivate it. So. I don't know. I mean, you're putting a lot of faith in these people in that situation. I think the practicality of it, I think the thing about the iPhone is that there is a tactile element to it. I think the sense of touch is important to people. And just having something projected on your hand, it's cool, it's novel, but I think it it doesn't meet that that need that we have sensory wise to like be able to touch something like haptic touch that you touch it and you can feel the sense that you're moving through things, you're opening things, you're scrolling. Uh, and then there's so only let's so much sound off. Sorry, Keith, totally cut you off there. I want to sound off though, from what we've talked about so far, who would actually put it in their cart? 
I, Caitlin, probably would not. I just don't think it's worth the money. Not yet. I think, not for six ninety nine. I think the biggest value of this, like you were saying, Keith, is that translation feature. Right. I think that mm, is very yeah. cool. Like the biggest obstacle, I think, when groups are going on like mission trips or things like that is we have to get a translator or maybe like we have a translator, but they don't speak the exact same dialect as the people we're ministering to. And so we need someone who like can translate from like my wife went on a mission trip and they had like three translators to eventually get it to English. Um, mm. So if you had something where it was just like instant, everyone can speak each other's language. That is, I think that's pretty valuable, but. So JT, you would put it in your cart? If I was going on a mission trip. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Kaylee, would you put it in your cart? Absolutely not. I, okay. <laughs> I one am not a huge fan of AI in general. I'm pretty anti AI, but also the thought of having a magnet that close to my organs <laughs> all the time really freaks me out. I love that you're and worried so, about the magnet. So the health benefits. <laughs> well, I'm thinking I'm going to wear it like right over my like heart, like a name tag. And so I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure if I want that much, that powerful of a magnet. I don't even like to wear Bluetooth headphones. So like, let alone put a magnet on my chest. As she wears so Bluetooth not. headphones. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were a gift. <laughs> All right, Keith, would you put it in your cart? Yes or no? If I had seven hundred dollars to blow, just to play around mm. with it, tinker with it, absolutely, because I think it's really interesting okay. and novel. But practically, I don't think I would ever really truly put that in my cart. Okay, and Luke? No, I would. I mean, not. we know how you feel about <laughs> subscriptions. I, well, regardless of the subscription piece, uh, there's so many pitfalls to this product that they haven't thought through, which is why they're letting four percent of their staff go. I can tell, but mm -hmm. uh, I just don't see the ROI. And the honest truth is, Keith and I work in the same office, so he would get it, and I'd go down there and play with it for a day, and go, "Yeah, no, proof." <laughs> truth. <laughs> Well, I love that this new segment kind of leads right into one of our other segment of what's in your cart, where we share a fun piece of something that our team has found or discovered or has that we definitely recommend shopping for. Uh, Kaylee, you've got a big item in your cart from the new year. Can you talk to us about that? I would love to tell you about my new prize. So I bought the newest iPad Pro with the M2 chip. I don't know what that means if I'm being really honest, but I know it'll matter to some of you techies. Uh, so I thought I would just throw that in. And the Apple Pencil. So I've been wanting this for years. As a creative, as an artist, as a writer, this is really beneficial because it's so easy to transport. I can throw it in my bag. I don't have to worry about, you know, a laptop that's heavy that I might drop, you know, put a case on everything, of course. But the reason I love it and the reason I think it's beneficial for people in churches, creative teams, is because you can buy a little dongle and edit photos, edit videos, and sit in service, which is huge for creative teams. If you are in a conference, like SALT conference, and you bring your camera and you want to take pictures, you can actually sit there and edit. And you can use things like Procreate, which is one of my favorite apps I use to digitally draw. I create fonts. I do so much stuff in Procreate. So this is like my new favorite baby and I am obsessed with it. So I wanna know what you guys think. If you've tried the new iPad Pro, if you have an older Pro and are not sure of like the pros and cons, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd like to make a PSA. <clears throat> we do not publicly support you editing photos during your sermon or SALT <laughs> conference <laughs> keynotes. So that PSA has now been publicly stated. I've never done that. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> Doo -doo -doo -doo. Well, I remember when the iPad like remote tools first came out, how many audio engineers in churches were using them to get like a better mix throughout the sanctuary. And I know that's like a normal feature now, but it used to be such a huge thing. So I don't know what like the new iPad supply or what the M2 chip allows because of it. But Luke, I'm guessing you probably have a lot of technical knowledge on that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to try not to get onto a giant soapbox here because of all the Apple devices pre the Vision Pro, as I just sort of blew up uh, my beliefs in the Vision Pro, <laughs> uh, the iPad's actually my least favorite device of Apple and had been for the longest time until the Pencil got released. In fact, I'll never forget, I mean, I had two iPads or something and I would try my hardest. I'm like, I just don't see this. I don't see the translation between computer 
to iPad. I was super inefficient trying to type on this thing. I'm like, I would just use my phone if I needed. Um, until the, the pencil came and someone on our team had it at a site visit and they started taking photos and then they started like drawing things on it in an app called Good Notes and I fell in love with it and I had to immediately go get one. And so I actually do have an iPad Pro. It's, it's not the new one that you have, um, but I love it. And, and I think for techni technical setups or if you're working with a ministry and they're wanting to do something creative, whether it be outside or inside, you could like easily grab you know, some of these notes things and take notes or draw on photos and be like, okay, we're going to move this here. Or here's what our set's going to kind of look like. What a great sort of like whiteboard tool that you can draw on real photos. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of kind of where it is, but I was against it for the longest time. I love it for the project management and communication side of it as well. I am not super creative when it comes to like the artsy fartsy stuff, nor am I technical to be like mixing on my iPad. But I absolutely love note taking. I love Asana on the iPad, all those different project manageable management and like note notable tools, I think are fantastic. And I love that technology is in a place where I can handwrite something and it cleans it up to be type so I can easily then send it off. And that is where I love my my iPad. Again, I don't have a newer one like Kaylee, and I think she is like living her best life on the creative side because of what it can do. But I just love my iPad for those things. And I'm with Luke. Until I had the pencil, it wasn't that useful to me. How much then. does this iPad cost, Kaylee? Um, I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't know. I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it. You got that bonus money. Ain't worried about it. <laughs> I got it open box at Best Buy. So I guess it was one of their displays. And so it was actually cheaper. Uh... I know it was over $1,000. And then my pencil mm -hmm. was also an open box item, but it's the newest pencil as well. So it has the mm -hmm. magnetic charging on the side, which is great. Um, but that was maybe $85. But to Luke mm -hmm. and Caitlin's point, if the Apple Pencil didn't exist, I wouldn't own an iPad. Everything I do on it, other than recording audio, I use my pencil for. So like social media for church, I'm able to draw for stories, for Instagram, on photos, I'm able to write things. I'm able to take notes, which is a huge thing. So I think if you're going to buy this, you need to get the Apple Pencil. So it looks like actually all Apple iPads now work with Pencil. Um, some only work with the first gen, but the, it looks like the starting price is like 449 for the 10th gen iPad. But iPad Pro and iPad Mini and iPad Air all work with the second gen, which is what you're talking about. And I think the magnetic made all the difference in the world. The whole like having to plug it into the side of the iPad was just silly to me. So yeah, game changer. <laughs> also, well, I was going to say the other feature I use on iPad Pro is Sidecar, where you can like connect it as like a secondary monitor. If you're working in a meeting or something like that, I've just gotten so used to double monitors. So. So I, I will say, not on the pencil side of things, the other reason I use my iPad is to lay down and watch shows. I want to chill on my couch and watch a show that's different than my husband and what he's watching on TV. Uh, so I don't need my Apple Pencil, but I love having an iPad just as a smaller screen. You don't have to tote around the laptop and you can just watch stuff on the iPad. It's like a little mini personal TV, <laughs> which sounds silly because everyone just does that now. But if you think about it, it's your own little personal TV. Uh, so shameless transition then to our next segment of what are you watching? Uh, because I did watch this on my iPad. Uh, we have a salt workshop called how to create an invite culture through marketing. And I have to say this class was very helpful for me at our staff retreat at the beginning or at the end of the year after conference, uh, we talked about as a team, how many younger people we saw walking through the door this year at salt. And we had to ask ourselves that important question. Are we marketing and talking to like the next generation of church worker, the next generation of those serving in their local church? We know I hope no one is offended hearing this, that the boomer generation is transitioning out of the church. They are. It is time for retirement. They are leaving. They're handing down the baton. And it is time for the millennials to pick it up. So millennials are coming, picking it up. And Gen Z is entering the workforce. Uh, so how are we including all of these generations in our marketing as a team and as a church and with a different, like, events that we're doing throughout the year at our church. And Kedron Brush taught this class and I just found it so insightful. As a team, I think we can all agree we hate talking about post-pandemic now, right? It's just, 
We don't like the word. We don't even like to think about it. But the truth is transitions and things have definitely changed since COVID. Uh, and it has to be acknowledged here and there. And Kedron does an awesome job of talking about specific ways to market two different generations and specific things that have changed since the pandemic that need to be taken into account when you're marketing for your church. So I don't want to spoil anything. I really want to encourage you guys go to saltuniversity.com. Go watch Kedron's class. It is up and available if you have an account with us. Um, But I do want to give you a few tidbits because I just found them so useful. Number one, uh, almost just reminders. uh, But post-pandemic, people are so much busier. So you need to be putting things in front of their face more and more. It used to be the audience had to hear a message three to five times before it would really sink in and they'd take notice. Well, that has changed. You now have to hear something seven to nine times in order for it to really sink in and for people to like actually pay attention to whatever you're talking about or marketing. Um, And then uh, some fun things, you know, keep things snack size or make it snackable. If you're a millennial, y'all remember Lunchables, right? Did anybody eat Lunchables as like their high school lunch? Oh, heck yeah. And I can't wait for my daughter to eat Lunchables so I can potentially sneak one out the door as well. Oh my gosh. You're going to start bringing Lunchables to the office? Yes. (laughs) My boys, my twin boys are obsessed with Lunchables. I don't think they go a day without eating one. Oh my gosh. That's great. Uh, Maybe, maybe unhealthy. I don't know. (laughs) Great, delicious wise. Well, when doing your content marketing or marketing to the different events and the different generations in your group, no matter the generation, like Kedron pushes, like make it snackable. Now your older generation will have more time to read that newsletter, to read the long email or the blog post. But for the most part, you got to make things snackable in order for people like latch on and want to learn from it and want to read more. And then also the things that I found super interesting, again, I don't want to spoil the whole class. Like I want you guys to go watch this. Uh, but she said, post pandemic, you know, there's, they always, those marketing people are always doing surveys saying, what are the top five, you know, most effective things you can do to market? And if, it was just so interesting, blew my mind. In the top five post pandemic, we saw a huge switch from digital marketing back to t- t- traditional marketing. Uh, billboards and like physical mailers are back in the top five ways to market and like are the top five most effective ways to market to people, which Billboards, I'm like, does anybody trust billboards anymore? But apparently it's like one of the best ways and maybe because it's both snackable and in your face so often, but then mailers, sorry, like did, that one sorry, really surprised me. Sorry, did you just say billboards me. are snackable? <laughs> I've never eaten they, a billboard. They are, so I don't because know it's like little... <laughs> It's because, you know, it's that little bit. You just get that little bit of information, but it's enough to make you go to the website or check out the social account. So it's snackable. I, I do think for churches, billboards have an opportunity um, just to kind of remind us as we're getting out of the house Mm -hmm. and we're driving around and we're so busy, um, especially if the billboard's really close. I know Passion City Church has a billboard that's like right next to their entrance to their parking Mm -hmm. lot. And it's kind of like a, it's almost like a welcome sign, you know, and they change it out for their series or whatever. And it's kind of always fresh. So, I I mean, I I do think billboards, I mean, I look at them. I mean, who doesn't look at them while you drive in some regard, you know? Hopefully you're not staring at your phone, looking at Facebook, seeing those Facebook ads. So when it comes to billboards, I've always noticed that, uh, yeah, I, I see, I do look at billboards, but the ones I remember are the ones that are sporadically around town that keep showing up over and over again. So like sometimes I lay down to sleep at night and I close my eyes and Mark Spain, real estate agent in Nashville, Tennessee, literally haunts me okay uh so it it, there's something we are not sponsored by we're not sponsored we're taking nothing from him but (laughs) we're we're open to talking about it if you're listening mark uh but yeah there there's something snackable about that right that you're kind of like taking Mm -hmm. in that content kind of repeatedly and then it just works its way in to where even if you're just like sitting on your couch in your living room you can picture the message you can picture the image Mm. you know so i'm gonna I'm going to push back uh, as the salt marketing guy. 
It's because uh, he doesn't have a budget for I, billboards in his salt <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I would say Keith is not your traditional uh, target audience member out there. Hmm. Uh, so most of your people are not going to go to sleep <laughs> thinking about your billboard. <laughs> um, I, I So I used to live in Louisville, and we had billboards everywhere. And I could not tell you what a single one of them said, except for one. It was a car dealership billboard. It had been there since I was a child, and it had a giant Jeep on top of it. So I remember the yellow Jeep, but I don't know what the billboard said. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was wild that they put a car up on top of it. I can challenge your challenge (laughs) by saying that Chick-fil-A has used billboards a ton, and you probably have definitely seen their cows painting Eat More Chicken on the billboard. I have seen Chick-fil-A. But would I have gone to – I was already going to go to Chick-fil-A. That's the thing. So the billboard – didn't make me go to Chick-fil-A. I was already headed there. It was just letting me know what was coming. It was just prophesying. That's what you think. You're closer to the And he just opened up Pandora's box we don't have time to go into, but why does (laughs) Coca-Cola, you know, do any sort of advertising if you're going to drink it anyway? I mean, it's just recognition and constant Mm -hmm. reminders and being in your face. Yes. Yeah, preventing Popeyes from saying they have a better chicken sandwich or something. Well, and of course, we're not sleeping on the tactics, especially those younger generations, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. Um, for for those of you who maybe are listening or and or fall into, let's say, the boomer or elder millennial generation, TikTok is not dancing videos, not anymore. That's maybe how it started. Uh, but TikTok is really what we call the Pinterest of social media, although Pinterest does count as social media. But it is a place for authentic videos, ideas, conversations. It has changed drastically. So if you're trying to reach those younger generations and you're not on TikTok or you have never looked at it, you should check it out and take a look. Uh, but yeah, no, those those two non-traditional methods of the billboard and mailers are really just the surprising news that Kedron shared in her workshop that those traditional agencies are back. The, those mediums are part of the top five ways to reach people again. And it's just... It blew my mind when she said that. So check out Keydrum Brush's workshop. Again, it's on Salt University. If you want to go there, uh, find a subscription and take a listen. There is just so much to learn from everything that she shared. It's crazy. And then right after her, um, Stephanie shared a class about SEO marketing and the best way to get the most like bang for your buck with SEO marketing and ads and all of that. Um, But yeah, that's what I've been watching. All right, we are stepping into a new segment. This segment is called the Salt Creative Challenge. I'm super excited about this segment. This is an opportunity for us to think of some ways and give you some ways to maybe stretch you, uh, make you try some new things that you wouldn't try unless we told you to, uh, and give you some new ways to look at things. So that's kind of the whole purpose of this segment. We'll do it every week. Uh, And then we're going to also include a way for you to share it with us using the hashtag salt creative challenge. So if you share your creative challenge with us, we're going to interact with you. We're going to share ours as well. So uh, that's kind of a fun way for us to see what you guys are doing. But this first monochrome podcast salt creative challenge uh, is a way for you to see your designs, your artwork, your lighting, uh, your sound design, whatever you're doing, wherever you work in the church through a new lens. So what our challenge is, is for you to go out into your city, into your environment and write down 10 elements. They can be fonts uh, that you see at your coffee shop. They can be styles or uh, textures or uh, the geography or lines or whatever that is, Uh, colors, gradients of the sky, sounds that you hear uh, and that are reoccurring themes in your environment and then find a way to implement them into what you're doing on Sunday morning. So for example, if you are in Nashville, there are lots of murals in Nashville and they all have different styles and things like that, but they're, it's a mural heavy city. So maybe that's something you try to implement into your design this week. Or maybe you are in Indiana and you're watching a beautiful sunset uh, with the clouds going down over the corn and there's these cool gradients. And so you implement that gradient into your design, your lighting design for Sunday morning. So that's the challenge. We want you to video, take a picture of it, export it and put it on Instagram, however you do that and share it with the hashtag salt creative challenge. We're going to share ours uh, this week and we'd love to see yours. So that's a challenge. Well, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, It is 
it just means so much to us that you have joined us for the first episode ever of the monochrome podcast brought to you by the salt team as part of the salt community kind of atmosphere uh we're so glad that you joined make sure to subscribe so you check out when the next episodes are here and you can stay on beat with us and we want to make sure uh, that you are just a part of the creative community so follow us on socials visit saltcommunity.com to check out everything we have going on we are much more than just an annual conference so if you're missing out on what's happening throughout the year you are missing out of really being part of the community so again check us out salt community or saltcommunity.com and we look forward to seeing y'all with us on the next episode